You know, we just came off the Easter holiday where millions of people around the world stop and pause to think about the resurrection of Jesus Christ. As Brad mentioned last week, it's an event that should be celebrated more than once a year, but something we remind ourselves on a daily basis. Now, why is that important? It's important because how you and I embrace the cross will determine the future of our life. Isn't that true? If you reject the cross, your life will reflect it. However, if you accept the cross, your life will demonstrate Christ-like qualities that will leave a lasting impact. Now, before we leave the cross and run off to the next holiday, it's important to stay at the cross. That's what I wanna to do today. I wanna to stay at the cross, and I want us to notice how incredible Jesus is. Can we do that together? Good, I'd like to. Now, by doing that, we continue to realize and appreciate how much Jesus loves us. Now, go ahead and open your Bibles to Luke chapter 23, as we'll start there for our text. But before we start reading, I, I wanna help build this particular story. Now, let's talk about the relationship between life and God. For many of us, life and God get confused. They appear to be one and the same. What do I mean by this? For example, when life is good, we think God is good. When life is not good, we can think that God is not good. If life gets really tough and we experience extraordinary disappointment, it's easy to get disappointed with God. Now, maybe we've gone through some challenges in life. Perhaps loved ones have died unexpectedly. Maybe, maybe we get an illness in life or something bad happens to us. It's easy to get disappointed with God or assume there is no God at all. Disappointment with life becomes disappointment with God. Do you see the relationship that I'm talking about here? Now that's a tough pill to swallow when your dreams don't come true and people around you they just tell you to just pray and trust God, and you're having a difficult time doing that. You know, after a while, you begin to equate your life experiences with who God is. And you decide, because life isn't going well, that God is not good, or God doesn't care about you, or God is not personal, or God is not active, or perhaps there is no God at all. And when you get to that space in your thinking, you either don't know or you forget about stories like about Abraham, who had to wait 25 years for a promised child to arrive. Maybe, maybe you've forgotten about Moses' life and how his life started to get interesting at age 80. Then we have Jesus himself who lived a sinless life and yet experienced rejection and the most gruesome death imaginable. But what makes this relationship with life and God so complicated is if you were taught that God is behind everything. Then it's easy to confuse your life experiences with God. Do you see where I'm going with this? It becomes virtually impossible to prevent your frustrations with life from becoming frustrations with God. If you're frustrated with life, you can easily attach that and blame God for it. But here's something that's super important to understand. Do you wanna know what it is? It's important to understand that our circumstances are not a measure of how much God loves us or whether he's pleased with us. Did you catch that? Let me say it another way. What you're experiencing in life 
whether good or bad, is not a good measure of how much God loves you or whether he's pleased with you. This, this is so important because if you and I are able to actually separate this, we're going to see and feel God's love more clearly in our lives. Okay, let's get to our story. Today we're going to talk about a character whose life just spun out of control by the time his path crossed with Jesus's. Now we don't know how old he was, we don't know his name, but we do know he ended up in a Roman jail cell. He was condemned to death because he was a thief. He couldn't be trusted as a slave, he couldn't even be trusted to row a Roman galley. His only value was to be an example of, of what happens to you when you defy Rome. They condemned him to death by crucifixion as a warning to others who might consider breaking Rome's laws. Now this man had seen crucifixions. He'd seen the aftermath of crucifixions. He knew exactly what he was in for. He heard the screams. He knew the smell, he knew the outcome. Now, even though he would be defiant, he knew death would eventually take him. His body would be taken from the cross, put on a, a wagon carted to the south side of Jerusalem into the Valley of Gehenna, and left in the city dump because no one would be given permission to go claim it. But this man decided he would die the way he lived, defiantly. And on the morning, they dragged him out of that jail cell. He discovered two other people would be crucified that same day. One was another criminal, like himself, and the other was a man by the name of Jesus. He'd heard about Jesus, but didn't really know him. Now, let me give you a, a side note. It's important to understand that crucifixion was the most terrible way to die. It was hours and hours of pain, terror, and humiliation. In some instances, it took two or three days for a crucified person to die. Both men and women were crucified. Now, for Jesus, before being crucified, he was flogged. In other words, he was stripped of his clothing and he was whipped. Most don't survive through that torture. Those who are crucified are further humiliated to carry the crossbeam, which could weigh over 100 pounds. Now, once Jesus was put on the cross, the people began to divide up his clothes and gamble for it. You know, perhaps it would make nice souvenirs to have the clothes of the one who called himself the Son of God. People had gathered from all over town because everyone came to see a crucifixion. You know, there's something about tragedy and pain that's embarrassingly fascinating. I mean, how many of us, we slow down on the highway to see what's happening during a traffic accident? We just, we can't look away. We've got to look. Now, it wasn't just the common people of Jerusalem who had come to see Jesus die. The rulers, the very people who had Jesus arrested were crucified, were there. And crucified were there. Luke chapter 23, in verse 35 says, the people stood watching and the rulers even sneered at him. They said, he saved others. Let him save himself if he is the Christ of God, the chosen one. This was the group of people who had the most to lose from Jesus' success. From now on, they were in charge and this was their moment to take revenge on him. Even the soldiers joined in as well. 
On Hollywood movie crucifixions, the crosses rise high above the ground and everyone looks up at the people being crucified. Now, that's not how the Romans did it. Contrary to popular opinion, crosses were not high off the ground. The feet were probably only a few inches above the ground. You and I need to remember the point of crucifixion was humiliation. These Roman soldiers were able to walk up to Jesus almost face to face. They were able to scream at him in his face. They were able to spit in his face. Luke chapter 23, verse 36 and 37 says, the soldiers also came up and mocked him. They offered him wine vinegar and said, if you're the king of the Jews, save yourself. Now, here's an interesting detail that's found in the Gospel of Luke and then in Matthew. Luke wrote in his Gospel that one of the criminals hurled insults at Jesus. That's in chapter 23, verse 39. Now, Luke was a doctor who wrote this Gospel by interviewing eyewitnesses. But when Matthew, who was one of the 12 disciples and an eyewitness to the events, wrote his Gospel, he said both criminals turned their anger away from the crowd and toward Jesus. And we find that in Matthew chapter 27, verse 44. In the same way, the robbers who were crucified with him also heaped insults on him. So in other words, the two criminals that were crucified next to Jesus Christ joined in as well in the mocking and the persecution. Now, take a moment and imagine this, guys. Everyone in the crowd, the rulers, the soldiers, even the two criminals being crucified on either side of him are mocking and insulting Jesus. Some of them are spitting on him. And there was a reason Jesus has started this level of anger. Luke captures it in his gospel in chapter 23, verse 39. One of the criminals who hung there hurled insults at him. Aren't you the Christ? Save yourself and us. I mean, wasn't, wasn't Jesus supposed to be able to do something about this? If he was the Messiah, couldn't he save himself and the criminals? You know, we might think similarly today we might think things like, you know, if there's a God, why is there so much suffering and pain? Why am I going through this if there's a God? Why do I have this illness? Why am I sick? Why do I have these problems in life? If Jesus is the Messiah, couldn't he save himself and me too? You know, and then suddenly, in the middle of all that chaos and pain, this one criminal, he stops shouting insults at Jesus because something so unimaginable happens. That he, that he recognizes in an instant there's something different about this crucified rabbi. And in Luke chapter 23 and verse 34, Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they're doing. Guys, this is phenomenal. Jesus, he prays for his persecutors. He prays for his enemies. He prays for the very people who are hurting him. I mean, is this what you and I would be doing for people who had put us on trial? Would you be, would you be doing this for the, the people who convicted you incorrectly? and now went to the extreme of crucifying you? Who would do this? 
What, what kind of man would pray for their persecutors and their enemies? What kind of man is this? And it, and it dawns on this criminal that, that Jesus is a righteous man sent from God. At some point, he had to pivot in his belief. He had to turn in his understanding of who, who Jesus was, who was being crucified right next to him. And he starts to understand who Jesus is right on the cross. He starts to get it. I mean, what, what if Jesus really is the Son of God who takes away the sins of the world? I mean, the light bulb finally turns on over this guy on who Jesus Christ is. And then he confronts the other criminal. In verse 40 and 41, but the other criminal rebuked him. Don't you fear God, he said? Since you're under the same sentence, we're punished justly, for we're getting what our deeds deserve, but this man has done nothing wrong. Here was a man suffering unjustly, but who still believed that God could be called Father. Here's an important point I don't want you to miss. Jesus was not drawing conclusions about God based on the way life and others were treating him. If you and I can separate this in life, we're going to see and experience God more clearly. You know, suddenly for the, the criminal, there was like a new category. He was he was beginning to see Jesus in a way that no one in the crowd was seeing him, and he starts having a conversation with Jesus. In the final moments of his life, on his death cross, not his deathbed, this thief has a conversation with Christ. He realizes that if an innocent man like Jesus Suffering like a guilty man like him could maintain faith in God. Then a guilty man who deserved his punishment ought to be able to do the same. Gosh, and in that moment, the criminal realized that Jesus really was the Messiah. Wow. You and I need to pray for moments like this in our life. This criminal, he saw God. He got it. He saw the Savior who the Jews were waiting for. He saw his opportunity to be saved. In chapter 23, verse 42 through 43, look what the criminal said. Then he said to Jesus, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus answered him, I tell you the truth. Today, you'll be with me in paradise. I mean, this criminal asked Jesus to remember him when he came into his kingdom. Not because of anything the criminal had done, but in spite of everything he's done. This is how God saves us. Not because of anything that we've done, but in spite of everything that we've done. We are all like this criminal, hanging on the cross, deserving the punishment for our sins. This is the basis of our salvation. According to Mark chapter 2, verse 10, Jesus had the ability and authority on earth to forgive sins, and that's exactly what he did for this criminal. He forgave him. You see, the point in time when God forgives us of our sins is the point in time that we're saved. Now, what does God call us to do today? When are our sins forgiven. 
The Bible tells us in Acts 2, verse 38 through 41, Peter replied, repent and be baptized. Every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. With many other words, he warned them and he pleaded with them, save yourselves from this corrupt generation. Those who accepted his message were baptized and about 3,000 were added to their number that day. God calls each of us to repent, to turn away from our sins, and then to be baptized, to be immersed in water for the forgiveness of our sins and we'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. 3,000 people accepted the message and were baptized that day and started their born again lives. This is what we're called to today. Let's get back to this criminal. He was literally on his deathbed his death cross. There was no rededicating his life to God. There was no turning over a new leaf in life. All he could offer was a desperate plea to Jesus for grace, mercy, and forgiveness. And that's what Jesus did. Even on the cross, Jesus was still saving people. How amazing is this? This is how much God loves us. Do you see what's happening? Do, do you see it? Do you get it? Jesus was merciful to this criminal because his thoughts about him and his love for him were not reflected in what was happening to him. He was absolutely a criminal. He wasn't a good guy. He wasn't a good person. He's going through some really challenging things right now in life. Yet Jesus' love for him was not reflected in or tied to his circumstances. Guys, what? What if that's true, that God and who he is is not defined by your personal life experiences? What if God loves you even when life has left you broken? Either you've caused the circumstances because of your choices or others have hurt you because of their choices. Now, what if God loves you even when you've made criminal type choices, being defiant, hurting others, and you deserve the punishment? How might that change the way you live out your faith? How might that change your motivation to live your life for Jesus? You know, you see, when Jesus died in the temple in Jerusalem, a heavy curtain separated the Holy of Holies from the rest of the temple. Only certain priests could go behind that curtain and only at a specific time for specific reasons. The Holy of Holies was a serious place because entering into God's presence was serious business. Matthew's gospel records an extraordinary event that happened when Jesus dies on the cross. In Matthew 27, verse 51 and 52, at that moment, the curtain of the temple was torn in two, from top to bottom. The earth shook and the rocks split, the tombs broke open, and the bodies of many holy people who had died were raised to life. In that moment, everything that separated human beings from God was torn away through the death of Jesus. So here's the question. How much have you allowed your circumstances to cause you to confuse life with God? How much have you drawn conclusions about God based on what has happened to you in life? 
Now, that's natural to do so. In some cases, it might be even unavoidable. But here's the thing. It's not true. Jesus' message to you from the cross is this. God, your heavenly Father, is not equal to what you have experienced. Look at Jesus' life. He was sinless and he experienced the worst imaginable death, and yet he was able to stay connected to God, his Father. His example shows us the way to stay close to God despite our life's circumstances. If you and I can figure this out, we're going to be able to trust God so much more despite our experiences in life. Don't miss this opportunity to draw closer to God. Don't miss this opportunity to be encouraged and inspired to be thankful. What can we thank God for? One, thank God for the opportunity to be saved. We're either saved or we're not. And you and I have one lifetime. We've got one shot to get it right with God and be saved. Have you repented and been baptized? Are you living a born-again life? Don't miss this opportunity in life to be saved. Reach out to your friend to get help and study the Bible. Reach out to us. We'd love to help. Secondly, thank God for the opportunity to be loved by him. I hope this story inspires you to see God's love for your life. Don't wait until you have a deathbed experience to reciprocate the love God has for you. Are you really going to wait till you die then to turn your life to God? I mean, why not live the majority of your earthly life for him now instead of taking a risky, unguaranteed chance of being saved at the end. There is no guarantee. Lastly, thank God for the opportunity to share the good news with others. The world has enough bad news going around. People more than ever need good news, and you and I have the opportunity to share it with other people. So who will you share the love of God with? Who will you help see Jesus? Who will you invite to church? Who will you invite to study the Bible? Who will you share the good news with today, this week? God will give you and, and me plenty of opportunities. We gotta make sure we seize it. You know, even though the Easter holiday has passed, we're gonna stick around the cross and admire how much Jesus loves us. Make decisions for God today. See you next time. God bless.